Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce Jean Valentine, who is the author of 11 books of poetry. Is it 10? 10. Okay, 10. Including Door in the Mountain, New and Collected Poems from Wesleyan, which won the 2004 National Book Award for Poetry. She's also edited a collection of essays on Eleanor Ross Taylor. Valentine's first book, published in 1965, was the recipient of the Yale Younger Poets Prize. She's also been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, or a Maurice English Prize, a Sarah Teasdale Award, and awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Bunting Institute, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the New York Council for the Arts. Her most recent book of poetry is Little Boat, which came out from Wesleyan Press in October 2007. Valentine has taught at Sarah Lawrence College, the Graduate Writing Program of New York University, Columbia University, and the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan, among other universities and colleges. She was born in Chicago and now lives in New York City. And let's welcome Jean Valentine. Thank you. Hi, and thanks for coming in from this beautiful day to be here. And thanks, Meg, and uh, I'm very glad to be reading at BU. I wanted to start by reading uh, a poem by Walt Whitman, A Noiseless Patient Spider. A noiseless patient spider I marked where on a little promontory it stood isolated, marked how to explore the vacant, vast surrounding, it launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself, ever reeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them, till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the gossamer thread you fling catch somewhere, O oh my soul. So I wanted to read some poems uh, from this book that I've just brought out a, a few months ago called uh, Little Boat. And uh, then I thought I'd read um, some new poems and uh, then a longer sequence that's also new. This is, this is uh, called La Chalupa, The Boat. And it was written looking at one of those <coughs> tablecloths where they have, uh, like the Lotteria cards, they have a, a word in Spanish and then a word in English. Alphabet uh, squares with pictures of the thing that they're talking about. So this is La Chalupa, the boat. And it had a picture of a young woman poling a boat which was decorated with flowers. I am 20 drifting in La Chalupa, the blue boat painted with roses, white lilies. No, not drifting. I am poling my way into my life. It seems like another life. There were the walls of the mind. There were the cliffs of the mind. There were the seven deaths and the seven bread offerings. Still, there was still the little boat, the chalupa you built once, slowly in the yard after school. This one is, is called um, The Artist in Prison, and it's about this outsider, so-called outsider artist named Ray Madison, who was put in prison when he was a very young 
really a boy, 16 or 17, and because uh, he had held up a 7-Eleven with a wooden gun that he'd made and painted black, and he got caught and put in jail. And uh, he discovered that he wanted to make art, and he got, uh, he had a, a gift for embroidery, and he got threads from the other prisoners' socks. They would give him their socks, trade for, he'd give them cigarettes or whatever money he had, if he had any, and they'd give him their socks, and he'd take the threads out and embroider these little pictures, two inches by two inches. And uh, it's a happy ending. He, by and by, got out of prison and, and married his girlfriend, and now they have children of their own, and they're teaching young people. Uh, and he's a very well-known artist now. He has shows all over the place. In fact, he did a, a picture of Fenway Park with his little threads. <laughs> this is the artist in prison. I will trade, what, cigarettes for their socks, for threads, to embroider little pictures for you, two inches by two inches. I will trade, what, whole days when I was free, red shadow on the inside of my skull, for socks, for threads. This is called But Your Touch. It, it, it's just uh, the first words of the poem, but this is about, uh, or written out of my reading that the Dalai Lama's physician was in jail for uh, 14 years uh, in Chinese prison. And when he got out, he didn't, he, I think it was in Boston, but he came somewhere to Western doctors and they found no trace at all of post-traumatic stress. And they said, how can this be? And he said, well, he felt that no matter how terrible the circumstances, some great human thing was always being accomplished. But your touch was everywhere, Lord, to be accomplished, though no one could see it. <coughs> A great human thing was being accomplished. It drew every last part of him into you. The lost sailors diving for mines off Korea. Every white hair, black hair, every invisible threshold, coarse and fine. And this one, uh, begins, Lord of the world, Lord of the world, soft, unconditional galaxies, look at me, look at me, far away, animal made out of dots, up in the other sky, woman, please you nurse my child, please nurse my other child, rub my hand, discovered, caught in the prisoner's hand, rub with your milk his hand. And this one goes, the door is fallen down. The door is fallen down to the house I used to try and pry open, in and out, painfully, stiff tears. I sit underneath the cottonwoods. Friends, what am I meant to be doing? Nothing. The door is fallen down inside my open body where all the worlds touch. And this goes, the father was a carrier. The father was a carrier. He had five buckets. How did he carry it all in those five buckets? And the men on the ship, they were all carriers, heads and backs and shoulders, lonely father, little brothers, husband, I miss you so. 
heavy laden. This goes, once I was girls and boys. Once I was girls and boys. Now, now who I love are the wild worn drifters, not of the town, cooking their supper out by the side of the road, kisses, kisses. And one especially, my father, my mother's father, lost, glare blue and shaved, at his own work, unknown, on your behalf, child, window, staring for you. This one's called The Eleventh Brother, and it comes from the Hans Christian Andersen story, The Wild Swans, where uh, there were 12 children and they were cast under an uh, enchantment and the, there was one sister and 11 brothers, and they were turned into wild swans. And the sister was able to save them, bring them back, that is, bring them back into human form if she could uh, weave shirts out of nettles for them by the next morning. And she got, and her favorite was the youngest, and she got all of them done except in the last shirt she didn't have both sleeves. She just had one sleeve done. And daylight came, and so he was changed back. They were all turned back into princes, but he had one arm still a swan's wing. The eleventh brother. The car you were driving flew off the bridge. It was drowning. This was after the wild swans, the story where even though you were her favorite, your sister couldn't finish weaving your shirt. So when you turned back to a man, one arm stayed a swan's wing. The car you were driving flew off the bridge. It was drowning. This was after the wild swans. Your sister had finished weaving your other arm. She dove down to give it to you through the gray water. You couldn't take it. You wouldn't. This is called Day and Night. Day and night in the little house, breath rising, falling, unreceived. What did I live mo what, excuse me, what did I love most in that house? What did you? I loved the most the early summer mornings, lying, touching, in the farmer's square bedroom, the window lightening on the left, the south, the homemade bed, the beach we had swum for, old, the dog kissing us. And, and this one goes all around the outside. All around the outside of the room I was given, they were lying, uncovered in plastic rags, newspaper, rusted tin, lying right up against the aluminum siding of the room I'd been given, as if it gave off warmth, the siding. So then I did, uh, most, of this, most of this book uh, consists of sequences. And uh, the first one, is is called uh, Jesus Said, and it's um, taken from the Gospel of Thomas, the Gnostic Gospel. Um, and it has in front of it, uh, Jesus said, split a piece of wood, and I am there. So the first one is called The Woman's Poem. An imaginary mother to know human love. Imaginary friends, monkeys, artists, to kiss and have fun. An imaginary husband, to be happy. But he was held on an island for life. Imaginary amnesty. But the real children. And now you say, split a piece of wood, and I am there. And I am there. 
This is called Annunciation Poem. And so it's the mother, in this case, it's the mother looking at the little child who's already born. My silky bed for you in front of the fire, a, a cup for your tea. I have set you a place inside the hollow tree, a plate for your bread. I thought I wouldn't find you, leaf or snow. Rainlight circles in the window, same light circles the bread, circles dark hair, your fontanelle. Since that second, you've been, been the eye of my eye. And the next one's called The Poet's Poem, which is um, taken a little bit from the idea that poets write while they're walking, which I think some of them do and some of them don't, but this is as if they all do. I thought my wearing out my shoes on poems would please you most. It was you pleasing me most. Longing to longing, thrown out from the stars. Now this is called The Teacher's Poem. And it has a, a quote from Picasso at the top of it. If you don't have red, use green. Jesus said, fix anything. Your granddaughter's sorrows, no. My sorrows, your end of life, sorrows, no. I couldn't fix the stovepipe, get heat. There was a past life I can't fix, a future life I can't fix, neither the red nor the green. This is called Death Poem. Jesus said, you knew me once, why will you not know me? You have moved against me, your whole earth gone, my life no use to you, my death equally no. And this is the afterlife poem. Jesus said, but I am alive. It's the same material, but lighter, summer stuff. Star coil, Ahmarava's hair. So that's that sequence. And then um, there's another sequence I'm going to read. Uh, it's called Strange Lights. And uh, these were all written about a, a little short stay I had in a hospital in Ohio. And I wasn't uh, sick, but they kept me there just to take tests and stuff. And it was a very peaceful little hospital in Ohio with not many patients. And it, it, was, it was really, I recommend it. <laughs> it was very nice. <laughs> so, uh, but these were written mostly after that, thinking about that. Hospital, far from home. No time alone. Well, this isn't true. I had a lot of time alone. I think that was written when I got back. No time alone, sun, rain. Can't talk, can't see out, can't even see to any depth down. What about youth, its car? What about the bride's foot, cinnamon slipper? Now you, Ohio, your winter fields like covers over me. And this one uh, is it's quoted from Blake at the beginning, and then some of it after that is lifted from uh, a wonderful book called The Wedding Dress by Fanny Howe. It's addressed to the fairies. So uh, first it's Blake talking about seeing the fairies in his garden. Hospital, at last I saw. At last I saw the broad leaf of a flower move, and underneath I saw a procession of creatures of the color and size of green and gray grasshoppers, bearing a body laid out on a rose leaf, which they buried with songs and then disappeared. It was a fairy funeral. So that's Mr. Blake, and then I'm talking to the fairies here. Dearest, what were you doing there tonight where they all understood everything they said? 
You came to make yourself a road through the house. A room, you said? Is it? It doesn't measure out. A poem? You cut it into pieces, slept under it. Time? You bore it on a green leaf under the ground. And this one is called Hospital Strange Lights, and it's about actually a doctor's appointment I had where the doctor uh, had to give me a little test, nothing. But he said, um, what do you do? And I said, I write poetry and I teach. And he said, I have a poem by heart. Would you like to hear it? And I said, yes. And uh, I thought it might be something by Robert Frost, because he seemed about my age and that that would have been what we'd been set to memorize when we were children. But it was a, it was a passage from the Song of Songs, which he had been memorizing because he was going to actually be singing it in his, uh, in his uh, temple on the following Saturday. So I didn't have the presence of mind to ask him what passage it was. It was in Hebrew. So I just made it up when I got home, a little a couple of lines out of the King James Version. I, uh, one line, actually, one phrase. Uh, in, the in the secret places of the stairs. And so here's this. I needed a friend, but I was in the other room. Not just the other room, another frame. Dragging blue or brighter blue. Strange lights. The doctor singing from the Song of Songs. In the secret places of the stairs. Us standing there in the past as we were in life. You turning and turning my coat buttons. This is called Hospital, It Was Euphoria. It was euphoria, little veins of it sent burst to the brain, three little fireworks, white on the gray MRI. It was euphoria when you stove my boat and brought me over, listing in the racing foam. And this is the last one of this sequence. It's called Hospital Scraps. Scraps of hard feelings left on the floor, winter material. But out the window, sun on the snow, dressmaker's pins, somebody's soul, a feminine glint in the trees. So I'm going to read you some from another sequence called A Bowl of Milk. First one is The Look. Pain took me, but not woke me. No, years later, your look woke me. Each shade and light. To earth love then I came, the first beach grasses. This one has a line from Frank O'Hara, uh, which is, I wanted to be sure to reach you, taking, taken from his poem, The Harbor Master. I wanted to be sure to reach you, but to go away, and I wanted to be sure to reach you, and the charge still in us, ankle, waist, and wrist, and eyes, not see you, or you to reach me, so with our townspeople, at last we could rest. But to you now I offer, forgive me, river, what I could never then give over. This is called This Side. The grave window eyes across the street look in, eyes open, half open, or gone asleep. Madonna, Lord, I wait, antenna out at an angle, wrapped with aluminum foil, the radio turned this way or that, or the aerial snaps right off, and I carry it with me, caduceus. 
And I left a bowl of milk outside the threshold. The night, the souls of the dead return, and in the morning, licked it where he licked. This one goes, I was lying there. I was lying there, half alive, in a wooden room at a Russian country place. You sat by me quietly. It's true you left sometimes, but came back, sat by me, kindly, quietly. Woodsman, would you go back to the little light-wrapped trees and turn them on again? The hide of the deer shivered. The summer wind riffled through my hair. You are on a long, patient summer visit from death. I am forgiven, forgiving, to your place, the next to be born. And then this is in three parts, the same end of that particular sequence, the harrowing. The worn hands, spines, feet. Even he whose blank hand I held on to for dear life. Phantom limb. On your sidewalk, walking past your cafe, the piano was being tuned hard, trying it one note at a time, trying walking outside of time. Was that the night and space? Blessed are those who break off from separateness. Theirs is wild heaven. So then the last sequence in this book, um, I'm just going to read you, uh, I think, three poems from. The first is called Maria Gravida, which um, means Maria pregnant, Mary pregnant. This was, in fact, I was at a show in uh, Prague with nothing but Madonnas and children, Madonnas and babies. We have a friend from Prague here. <laughs> Then the gold mother began her touching me with her long brown face and hands. She tickled me and told me I was beautiful. She held me in the icon and we gazed. We had a pretty goldfinch, death, salvation. Love was strong as death. Peacocks walked by, blue immortality. Finches played in black branches, souls around the cross. It was death in life. Not a casket, but a dark room for our love. The herma wrought of silver, gilded in fire, gold mother around me, inside me, gravida. Uh, this one is called Moose and Calf, and uh, I was up in Alaska giving a reading and teaching for a bit, and they said they'd take me to see anything I wanted, and I said, well, I'd like to see that big mountain you have up here, and I'd like to see a moose and a calf, and I'd like to see the northern lights. So I got to see the moose and the calf. There was clouds over the mountain, and I wasn't up late enough, I don't think, to see the northern lights. Oh, I must have been. It was dark all the time. But anyway, I didn't see them. Moose and calf eat the shoots of the willow trees along the Alaska Highway looking for you, thirsting after don't know, before I can't remember you anymore. Call to me, friend, whose heart in your side is broken in two, just by a chance comma of time. Still within the wound in your side is a place inviting fair, large enough, I saw, to offer refuge for all. The last three lines I forgot to tell you are from uh, a, a 14th century mystic in England named Julian of Norwich. So she says she saw a place inviting fair large enough to offer refuge for all. That was one of her visions. 
she uh, saw visions of Christ. Well, this one is called The Rose. A labyrinth as if at its center God would be there, but at the center only rose. Where rose came from, where rose grows, and us inside of the lips and lips, the likenesses, the eyes and the hair we are born of, fed by, and merry with, only flesh itself, only its passage, out of where, to where. Then God the mother said to Jim in a dream, never mind you, Jim, come rest again on the country porch of my knees. So that's uh, from that book. And then I'd like to read some, uh, I think I'd like to read from this new sequence I wrote um, and then read, see how the time is, maybe read some more new poems. Um, this is, I'm gathering my courage because I've only read this once before, but. Uh, it's called Lucy, and it's about, um, well, really, it's about a mother. To me, that's what it's about. We we'll see. Uh, it's Lucy who's, she was a very ancient skeleton that was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. And at that time, she was thought to be our oldest hominid ancestor, the only, the earliest ancestor they had found a skeleton of. Now they've found older ones in Europe. But let me just read you the scientific thing. Lucy, whose skeleton is approximately 3.2 million years old, whose genus and species are Australopithecus afarensis, or southern ape of afar, after the region of Ethiopia where the bones were found, was discovered in 1974 at Hadar in northern Ethiopia. Lucy remains the oldest and most complete adult human ancestor fully retrieved from African soil. The Ethiopian people refer to her as Dinkanesh, an Amharic language term meaning, you are beautiful. She's right now, her bones are in Houston. And uh, that was, you may have read about this in the papers, uh, because the Ethiopian people were understandably not happy about her bones being moved. And they had only seen them two days, I think, the actual bones were on view there. They, they had fake bones on view, but they wanted to be so careful. But then the Houston money came along, and they're over in Houston now. And, and the actually, the Smithsonian Institution said they should never have moved these bones. They're much too delicate. So that's uh, what's happening. And the other thing I meant to tell you was that she was named Lucy because in 1974, the Beatles were very big. and. When these guys came, guys and women, I suppose, came back to their campfire that night after discovering these bones, they turned on the radio and the, the song that kept playing was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So they named her Lucy. And I'll tell you a few things ahead of time about this because then I'd like to just read it right, flu right through. I have something from a psalm at the beginning. She sees, to me, she's a, a sort of combination of a mother and a god, as if to an infant kind of a mother uh, person. There's a line from William Carlos Williams that I use, my saxophage that splits the rocks. There's a reference to a spider because I was, uh, I was away in the country when I wrote this and there was a spider in the window cell, in the, in the window pane, uh, on the window pane. Then there's a reference to 9-11, and then there's four older women, friends of mine, who died last summer 
nothing to do with 9-11, but just other people I knew who had died more recently. Their names are Ruth, Grace, Helen Ruth, and Jane, so that comes into it. Then there's Nikolay, is the name of a monk in Chekhov's story, Easter Eve. Nikolay had just died, and his friend, which looks to me like it's pronounced Euronym, I'm not sure, is a lay monk who works the ferry across the river to the monastery. And so those are those names. I talk about wild turkeys and deer because I was in the country and was seeing them. I've got some Rilke lines from the Book of Hours. Lucy's picture, I mention, refers to a reconstruction by museum people, what they think from the bones that she might have looked like. Um, and then at the end, an outsider artist named Martin Ramirez comes into it. I want to read you the note about him because I don't have that um, by heart and it's, it's moving. He was a Mexican immigrant painter who lived for more than 30 years in DeWitt State Hospital in California. You may have heard of him because he's been showing around now. Uh, until his death in 1963. His work was shown at the Folk Art Museum down in New York last spring, so I got to see it. And now, you know, when he was in the hospital, people brought him paper bags and pencils and things like that to do his work on. And it's a familiar story, but now they can't pay enough money for these. But he's a wonderful artist if you get the chance. So I'll just read it through now. I think that's everything. Lucy, your secret book that you leaned over and wrote just in the dirt, not having to have an ending, not having to last. Then this is a psalm, a bit from a psalm. In thy book all my memories were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Two hands were all you owned for food, for love. Now you own none, Lucy, nor no words. Only breath marks, breath marks only, nor no words. Or what do you do now, Lucy, for love? Your eye holes. Lucy, my saxophage that splits the rocks, Wild good mother, you fill my center hole with bliss. No one is so tender in her scream, wants me so much, not just, but brings me to be, is when I am close to death and close to life. The spider in her web, three days dead on the window, Lucy. In the electricity of love, its lightning strike, or in its quiet hum in the thighs, like this little icebox here, not knowing any better, or in the dumb hum of the heater going on, little stirs in the room tone, I rush outdoors into the air you are, Lucy, and you rush out to receive me. At last there you are, who I always knew was there, but almost died not meeting. When my scraped out child died, Lucy, you hold her all the time. Lucy, when the dark bodies dropped out of the towers. When Ruth died and Grace and Helen Ruth and Iraq and Iraq and Nicolay Lucy, when Jane in her last clothes goes across with Chekhov, you are the ferryman, the monk, Euronym, who throws your weight on the rope. I wash my plate and spoon as carefully as a priest. Did you have a cup, Lucy? Oh God who transcends time, let Lucy have a cup. You bodhisattva here with us. You wanted to come back. 
I'm afraid and can't pay attention to it. I'm wild with heat and cold, and my head hurts. The nine wild turkeys come up calmly to the porch to see you, Lucy. This is called My Work of Art. I was in this beautiful room, but nothing on the walls, so I made a work of art <laughs> for Lucy. It's a piece of brown wrapping paper taped to the wall over the table in this beautiful room with no pictures. First, written across the top, quote, it was as if she was standing across the road waiting to see if anyone wanted to get to know her, unquote. Then taped under that, du der du weilst und dessen weitest wissen, you who know and whose vast knowing is born of poverty, abundance of poverty, make it so the poor are no longer despised and thrown away. Look at them standing about like wildflowers which have nowhere else to grow. Then a blue panther, a 26 cent stamp from Florida for postcards. Then a catalpa leaf curving from its huge curving stem, the leaf a little broken in its passing from the west down to the east. And the note, I found this leaf on my way to the post office. Then Lucy, you, hominid, sapiens, sapire, to taste, be wise. Your skeleton standing about like a wildflower. Lucy, what you want, that I will do, to hear you now, your poem, but you need nothing. The deer and the wild turkeys that draw close now to hear you, my life is for, in its language, your voice. I can't tell cold from heat, anxiety, dust, death, no, not even dust. Your picture, this is the picture that they made up from looking at her skeleton. Brown museum hair brushed the way they brush it there, brow lit from inside, intelligent eyebrows, a slightly wrinkly nose, a little flat, Brown woman, I want your nose, your cheekbones of light. I was brown, I got white. Your large and friendly mouth, half open, in a half smile, like the Dalai Lama once in a procession, his smile, like, what am I doing here? But Lucy, your eyes. So I gave all I had to the poor, standing about like wildflowers. Lucy, <coughs> Lucy, the spider moved last night and again this morning. I wonder, do you sleep and wake where you are now? Do spiders hibernate? Do they lay eggs in webs on window panes? You must know everything. Enter the sweet why. Don't entreat it or question why, whistle why, whisper why was sweetness done to you, done unto you. What I wanted most, the mother, has come to me. Will she stay in my ear? Lucy, is it you? Still all night long, my Lucy, I entreat you. I will not let thee go unless thou bless me. Outsider art. Martine Ramirez, be with me. It looks just like a vagina, a bystander said. Yes, it is a vagina with trains and tunnels, and like in the great cathedrals, a clitoris, a starry one, and a womb, jaunty Martine being born. Lucy, did you hear animal woman screams in the night? Were you afraid? Was it you last night? Your scream over and over as you give birth. How did you pray, Lucy? 
You were prayer, your hands and toes. When writing came back to me, I prayed with lipstick on the windshield as I drove. Newton made up with the world. He had already turned himself into gold. He was already there. Skeleton woman, in, down, over, around. Blessing from the Old English Blitzian. Its root is the same as for blood. My head is at your window, Lucy, at your glass. But we offer nothing but money now. We beam it to each other near and far. But you are my skeleton mother. I bring you coffee in your cemetery bed. This is the last one. This morning I miss most of all you, Martine, and her who, when you were born, looked and blessed your beauty. Lucy, when you are with me, I feel the atoms racing everywhere in this old oak table, in the eight-pointed double star spider, and in the starry rippling all around us. Skeleton woman, guardian, death woman, Lucy, here, a picnic, cornbread. Here, an orange with Martine and me at the lip of the Earth's surface world. We might, we have time? Okay, I'll. I'll Five more minutes in there? Okay. I'll just do a few more uh, new poems. This is called, this is called Then Abraham. Then an old man came down out of the thicket with an ax on his shoulder and with him, two people made out of light. One a blameless son, the other like a Vermeer girl, on their way back down with the old man. Still all the history of the world happens at once. In the rain, a young man holds out a blue cloth to caress her head at the landing excuse me, at the landing pier of the new bride. You can't get beauty. Still, in its longing, it flies to you. This is called Coyote. Walking last night in the drought country dark, she heard wolves howl. No. Coyotes, sexual love, coyotes crying, breathing close. This morning it was on the radio, it's turning a little cooler. She is turning, she has given her purse of money away. It's time to turn back into coyote. My, my coyote in the doorway, wild good that plums down deep inside her and she is a well. It's called her blessing. Her car had hit another car. The other driver's insurance person called. It was all going well, a matter of time. She lost her tongue. Her husband thought she meant it as a metaphor. It was her taste for life, her taste for herself, for others. She found her tongue on the floor and paper clipped it to the kitchen calendar. 12, 8, 07. It was going well. She began to drop. Then one day in spring, she dropped into an open well, her blessing. That's a very weird one, I think. This is called The World Inside This One. 
and it's got a quote from Paul Eluard, uh, there is another world, and it is inside this one. Steamer trunks standing on end, standing open like big books, the world inside of that one, mass graves like in this one. Inside of that world, someone painting animal souls. Inside the dark, huge sounds. And then, uh, this is the last one I'll read. It's called Time. It goes, time is matter here. Time is matter here. The freight train I saw in the morning, still in the evening, inching across the flatlands, word after slow word, too many to count. And you are matter, your eyes, your long legs, slow breath, sometimes catching in your sleep, your head resting against the bus window, tired horse, tired rider. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want you to stop. <laughs> I want to stay inside her world. That was beautiful. So I hope you'll stay around to speak to Jean and perhaps buy some books. And thank you so much for coming.